I'm so thankful that we were able to get together and enjoy the fellowship that we had last night. I want Mike and Mary to, to know that we missed them, but they disappeared on me. I want them to know that we consider them as family here at the church. I want to share something with you. I wasn't sure how the week was going to, the weekend was going to turn out in bringing three teenage girls to get them all ready in time to come to church for Saturday night and Sunday, but in, in the van, we needed a good sized van to bring everybody down in. Because you know, it seems like when my wife and I come, it's only one suitcase and one cooler, but when you bring the rest of your family and the children, it's like 16 bags. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I want you to, I'd like to introduce my family. I have my, brother, my son, Steve. Uh, he attends Bowling Green State University, so he's been able to work his schedule out to come with me. And my oldest daughter, Renee, who we just got to move back home so that she can attempt to go to college and uh, get a better job, try and get somewhere a little bit better in life. Uh, my youngest one that I asked prayers for, remember I told you she was 16 and the driving license and everything. And uh, well, we, evidently our prayers worked because for a month now she's been safe. <laughs> and I want to thank you for that, but don't, don't quit praying for her. What's her name? Uh, Melissa, that's right, 16 year old Melissa, and my very good prayer pal of mine, Sister Erica Whiteson, who came down with us. And I'm so happy to be able to have everybody come with us. I'm just, I'm just glad. I want to thank my children and my prayer pal for coming down and, and spending some time cooped up in the van with us, with mom and dad and aunt and uncle. I wrote a sermon a few weeks ago, actually last month, there was a, a topic on the fifth Sunday meeting program called Leading Men in a Difficult Way, and it was actually Preacher Larry's sermon, but because of his condition back then, I wasn't sure if he was going to be able to preach it, so I kind of made myself prepared, and the more I looked at it, the more I thought, you know, that would be a pretty good sermon to bring. And it was a comp it's just amazing how we can look at the same scripture and two preachers can go in totally different directions with whatever topic they have. Well, I expected when I opened up, he got to, to preach his sermon, and I figured, well, he's going to preach everything that I've got written down here. Never touched anything that I had written. <laughs> he, he went a totally different way. And that's not wrong. That just shows you how many different ideas that God can give us with the scripture that he's given us. So many things that he can put in our hearts that the people that we think the people need or that God says, I know the people that are going to be there and I know what they need this day and this is what I want you to bring. That's the way our, our Heavenly Father works. What I want to bring to you today, we always need to keep in mind. We always need to keep in mind, we are not easy people to lead. We are not easy people. We do not want to listen to what God's Word says. That's quite obvious. It's been evident for years, and it's still true today for us. We know what it says, we know what we've been told, but we just don't like to do that. For some reason, things seem to be more appealing to us in different directions. So we always need to remind ourselves, we are always, it's a constant battle to serve the Lord the right way. Satan doesn't want us to do that, and he's always on us to try and take us in a different direction, isn't he? First, I want to share something with you that kind of ties into this sermon. Now, my wife sent me this on the internet quite a while ago, but it makes me kind of smile when I read it. It's talking about Moses and the people that were in the desert. And it says here, but what was he going to do with them? They had to be fed. 
And feeding two or three million people requires a lot of food. According to the quartermaster general in the army, it is reported that Moses would have had to have 15,000 tons of food each day. Do you know that to bring that much food each day, two freight trains each at least a mile long would be required? Besides that, you must, you must remember they were out in the desert. So they would have to have firewood to use in cooking the food. Now that would have took 4,000 tons of wood and a few more freight trains each a mile long. That's just for one day. Now, they were there for 40 years. They would have to have water. And if they only had enough water to drink and wash a few dishes, it would take 11 million gallons each day and a freight train with tank cars 1,800 miles long just to bring the water. Now there's another problem. They had to get across the Red Sea at night. Now if they went on a narrow path, double file, that line would be 800 miles long. It would take 35 days and nights to get through. Now I'm not sure who came up with all these figures. But this was just an interesting point. So there had to be a space in the Red Sea three miles wide so they could walk across 5,000 abreast to get over in one night. But then there's still another problem. Each time they camped at the end of the day, a campground two-thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island was required or a total of 750 square miles. That's a lot of space for camping. Now, do you think Moses figured all this out on his own before he left Egypt? <laughs> no, I don't think he did. You see, Moses believed in God, and God took care of the things for him that were needed to be taken care of. So now the question I want to ask you, do you think God has any problem taking care of our lives? If he took care of that many people's lives for 40 years and fed them and clothed them and took care of all their needs, why are you so worried about your life and God taking care of you? Amen. Should have no trouble putting our trust in God, should Amen. we? Yet I want to talk to you a little bit. It's found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, this morning. We're talking about the second generation here. We remember the first generation, don't we? Egypt, the, the Pharaoh said, go, take all of you, just leave, take everything that you own. And they headed for that promised land. But yet, because of disobedience, because of not trusting in God, they wandered around. That 11-day trip took 40 years, and only two of them survived. All those perished in that first generation, right. because of disobedience. But now we're coming here to the 8th chapter in Deuteronomy. We're looking at the next generation, those children. They're now prepared to go over. God has said, it's time. You're ready to go over. And Moses, I want you to tell these people what I want from them. And it wasn't anything new. Chapter 8, I'd like to read the whole chapter for you. And then I want to show you some things that are in there. Chapter 8, verse 1. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee known that man doth not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth into thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of those hills thou make diggest brass. When thou hast eaten and are full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwell therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from thy house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. And he may establish his covenant, which he sware unto thy fathers. And it is this day, as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them and worship them. I testify you against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. You see their aunts and their uncles and their grandparents and their moms and dads had that same promise. God was going to give him that land with all its goodness. And he was going to take care of them, but they were disobedient. And now it was their turn. And he was saying to them, if you'll just listen to me, if you'll love me, if you'll keep my commandments, I will do this for you. He still says that to us today. And we still find a way to turn our back on them. Yeah. Amen. Leading men in a difficult way. Only Moses could know about leading men in a difficult way. What a job he had to take on. What an amazing job that God had asked this one man who was so sure that he couldn't do it. Yet after God proved to him many times that he was with him, and Moses took on that task. I wonder how many times he shook his head because of the people yeah. that gave him trouble. <clears throat> how many times did he go to sleep at night thinking, why don't they listen? What is wrong with these people? He had a job, he had a task that was very difficult to lead these people that just didn't want to listen. And God knew how much trouble they were going to be. But God prepared him for the task. And now, since the old generation was gone, Moses is coming to this new generation and he's telling them, we're ready to go into Canaan now. God's given us permission. That 11-day journey that took 40 years, don't ever forget it. Learn from it. 
Moses is instructing them right here. God's given you commandments. Just obey them and you'll earn this promised land. Now let's see. I want to read probably seven things out of these first two verses that God had given Moses to tell the people. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do. That ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord sware unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness. To humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart. Whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. The first thing I noticed that God's charging them to observe to do. He says, be careful to observe to do what I've commanded you. That means they had to have a head knowledge of God and a heart knowledge of God, didn't they? Amen. So that they could observe to do what he had told them to do. And he says, to live daily by the commandments that I've given you here. Observe these things and I'll bless you. He's given them a universal call here, number two, to do all the commandments. To do all the commandments that I have commanded thee. In other words, he didn't say, here's the list of commandments. The ones that you want to live by, you pick out. You choose the ones that you think you can handle, and then just disregard the rest of them. You don't have to listen to them because you're too weak to follow those. No, that's not what it said here. I think it said to listen to all the commandments that I have given thee this day. Not just the ones that you thought you could fulfill. Didn't tell them to select just the easy ones. They had to keep every one of them. And the Bible tells us that God's commandments are not grievous, doesn't it? They're not hard to keep. Number three, God was telling them that they had, he had to be their Lord. They had to have a holy fear of God. This is God's true desire. It says to fear God. That is the wisdom, isn't it? That is where we get our wisdom, fear God. He wants us to honor and praise him. He wants us to give him the glory. Which is due him, isn't it? Amen. It's the kind of love that he wanted us to have, kind of like a, a parent with a, with a child. A mom with a child relationship. Whenever a, mom, whenever a child gets hurt or, or a child is feeling low, who does, he, who does he run to? Who does she run to? Mom is always the one. There's a special bond between them. Even when a son or a daughter is far away from home, somehow moms have a sense of knowing that something's wrong. There's a... I don't know how to explain that communication that we just talked about. There's a communication that for some reason mom knows there's something wrong or when the child's in trouble far away, he knows or she knows I can just call home talk to mom and it'll be okay that's the love God wanted his children to have Amen. for him Amen. he wanted to be their Lord he said number four I want you to look back on the wilderness they had been in the wilderness for 40 years. He said, don't forget that time that you've been there. There's much learning that you learned. There's many things that you went through that you saw your parents, your family go through that you can remember. You saw them suffer. You saw the things they did wrong. Learn from that. Look back at what mistakes were made so that you know not to do them. Remember the discipline that I had put your family under, God was saying. Remember the disobedience of mom and dad. 
learn from it. Don't make the same mistakes twice. You see, the wilderness was a school, wasn't it? It was a learning time for those people. They needed to, you know what? Just like they needed to, sometimes we need to look back where we were at one time. Sometimes we need to turn around and say, can I see where God has brought me today? Can I see the goodness that he's done in my life? Can I remember what I used to be and what I am today because of God? That's what I want you as children to turn around and look. Remember the wilderness. Remember the old place that I brought you out of so you don't want to go back there again. Amen. Look back and see if there's a difference been made in our lives because God has changed us. Then he says... To humble and prove us in this first two verses. He wanted to humble and prove them, didn't he? Why would he want to humble and prove them? First of all, God did not want his children to be exalted above measure because of the miracles that were done for them. They could have got an awful big head on that. God's taking care of us. Whenever we're hungry, we just ask for manna and it comes out of the earth. We just comes right out of the sky and falls down. We just go out and pick it up. We want water. We smoke the rock, the water comes out. Seems to me I've been walking for 40 years in the same shoes and they're still good. I don't have to work to make shoes. I don't have to worry about being fed. I don't have to worry about the water. We've got a place to live. We'll just take it easy. No, that's not what he was saying. He wanted to humble and prove He didn't want them to be exalted above measure and say, look what God's doing for us. We can just sit back and take it easy. Live like a king. Sometimes we get that way in life, don't we? When everything's going real good for us. Amen. Nothing's going wrong in our lives and we don't remember God as much. We seem to not... Sometimes we'll slip up and say, you know, I forgot to pray this morning. No, that's okay. Everything's going good. Go to bed at night. Forgot to pray last night. That's all right. Everything's still going good in our lives. Nothing's going wrong. But the minute something happens, we turn right around and say, oh, God, I need you now. Yeah. yeah. He didn't want him to get a big head. He was proving them to test their trust to see if they would obey him or not. You see, you say, well, that's not very nice of God to test them. How do you know that? It says right there in verse 2, to know whether what was in thine heart. This is why God was doing it. To humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. He wanted to find out if these people would be loyal. Number six, he wanted them to remember the supplies that he had provided to them. God took particular care in their food, shelter, and raiment, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Endless supply of manna. Something that they had never seen before or their fathers had never seen before. This was something totally new that God had made for these people. Now if you go today to one of those dietitians and he'll tell you, well you've got to have so much meat and you've got to have so much fish and you've got to have this much milk and you've got to have this much vegetable to get a perfectly balanced diet so your body is fit. God sent one thing. Manna took care of every single thing they needed for their health. Yeah. Everything. There was something. This wasn't just plain ordinary bread, was it? This was bread from God, made special to take care of their every need for food.
Send them quail. They didn't, uh, you know what, this man, I'm getting real tired of this stuff. We've been eating it for quite a while. I'm just We need a variety, God. We're getting real tired of this. Okay, I'll send you quail. Getting tired of the manna? I'll send you quail. Endless supply of quail whenever they needed it. God was being so good to them. Whatever they were asking for, he was giving. They'd whine, he'd, come, he'd give it to them. They'd whine some more. They had no reason to whine, did they? Everything was being taken care of. Why would they whine? Their clothes never wore out. They walked around for 40 years with the same clothes, the same shoes. Ladies, I know that probably hurts you a lot because that means you didn't have to go to Walmart to go buy something. Honey, I can't go shopping because you don't need any clothes. <laughs> there would have been no need for stores. <laughs> Dress barn would have been out of the question. We wouldn't need that, would we? <laughs> Their clothes never wore out. Their shoes never wore out. Their health. Their health was good. The only necessary thing was trust in God and obey the commandments that I gave you. You know that manna meant something a little bit more than just food to him. It's God's way of saying that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth. Then God said, number seven, I want to show you the good things to come. I want to show you the good promises that are waiting for you. I'm sending you to a land that has everything you need in it. You'll not want anything. While there's even cities built for you, all you've got to do is go over and take over the people over there. The cities are yours. The food's there. This is a perfect place for you to go. And I've prepared it for you. He was trying to tell them the happiness of man consists not in being clothed in fine purple or a fine linen. Not in faring sumptuously every day. But being in a covenant with God and learning his righteous judgment was what God wanted them to learn from all this. Being under the, his mercy And then he tells them in step number eight, look forward to Canaan. Look what I've provided for you. A land that lacked nothing. Plenty of water. Fountains overflowing. Wheat, barley, vines, fig trees. Olive oil, honey. Sounded like heaven compared to where they'd been for 40 years, didn't it? It's exactly what it was. Heaven is a good land, while lacking nothing and with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's our heaven. We have a same place waiting for us if we trust in Jesus Christ. We have a land that Canaan already prepared for us. God is still being good to us today even though we're disobeying him every time we turn around. Trust in me, I'll give you eternal life. Accept Jesus Christ, salvation forever, a mansion built in glory, prepared for you when you go there, won't need clothes, you won't need food, you won't need anything, all you have to do is come up and worship me every day, and it's there for you. But all you have to do is obey my commandments. All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ, the one I sent down. Live the life I tell you to live, and it's all yours. Problem is, we still have that guarantee of eternal life and a home in glory, don't we? We have that. It's guaranteed to us, and we know it. So we can swell. If we just sway a little bit away from God, we'll still have that. 
I guarantee you what, you can go as far as you want to away from God right now if you're a safe believer, you're gonna, he's going to punish you. You will suffer something. He will chastise you before you go. The best thing for us to do is quit living like that and get back in the right way. Yeah, amen. It seems to me that today is no different than back in those days when God gives us the commandments today. And we have the history books and we can say one thing about history that from history we have learned absolutely nothing. We still do the same things that they did thousands of years ago. We're still just as disobedient as they were. We turn back in the Old Testament and time and time again we say, I just can't understand why them people did that. I just, I mean, it's plain and simple as the nose on your face that God said all you had to do is live right and he'd take care of you. How could they be so disobedient? <laughs> they were the ones making the history. We're the ones supposed to learn from history. We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. We need to understand what God is telling us from the past people, the ones that have conquered that, the ones that are there to say, don't go my way. Go the way of the Lord. Don't follow me. Don't do the things I did. The problem today people think God's way is too difficult yeah. it's just too hard to live that way I'm sacrificing too much of the world I don't want I don't want to give this up I don't want to give that up it was like the rich young ruler wasn't it go sell all that you have and give it to the